Okay, I think we can make a start. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adiba Kamarul Zaman, co chair of the AIDS 2022 and president of the IAS. Welcome to this se satellite session co organized by IAS and Medicine Spate and Pool on accessing long acting HIV prevention and treatment innovations, landscape, service delivery, and pathways to affordability. I see that there's a lot of interest in this session. It's lots of people in the room. That's great. The aim of this satellite is to provide the audience with the current landscape of HIV prevention and treatment, long acting technologies, discuss the differentiated service deli delivery models that can be used to ensure these technologies reach the various communities vulnerable to HIV and do not burden the healthcare system. And lastly, discuss pathways for timely and at scale access to quality, affordable, long acting HIV treatment and prevention. We'd like to thank our co organizers and particularly the IS Corporate Partnership Program sponsors and Medicines Patent Pool funders for making this session possible. <coughs> Please note um, there are some housekeeping rules um, that all virtual participants are muted and please place your questions into the Q&A section of the conference platform. Um, we encourage our in-person participants to come to the mic and raise questions. Please uh, state who you are and where you're from. And uh, we have a very packed agenda. We've got speakers and then as you know we have uh, a panel after this so when uh, later on, you ask questions, we, we, we ask that you, um, well, we, first of all, we ask the speakers to keep to your time and those asking questions to keep it short uh, as well as the answers. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-chair, Charles Gore from Medicine Spate and Pool, who will introduce um, the speakers. Great, uh, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, indeed, uh, uh, indeed, Adiba, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as Adiba said, this is quite a, a packed session, so um, it's our pleasure at the Medicines Patent Pool to co-host this session with uh, IAS uh, to discuss long-acting technologies for HIV prevention and treatment, and essentially how to accelerate access to fit-for-purpose quality versions of these health innovations, and in particular for low and middle income countries. So it's my great pleasure to uh, kick off by introducing Charlie Flexner, who as well as being a professor at John Hopkins University, is also uh, leading the uh, LEAP, which is the Long Acting Extended Release Antiretroviral Research Resource Program. Charlie, the floor is yours. Thanks everybody and uh, welcome. And I load up my slides. Um, for those of you uh, watching from home, in case you're curious, uh, I am wearing pants. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in three dimensions with all of you. And um, I'm particularly honored that uh, with us today is the current president of IAS and a past president, Anton Posniak. So I think that indicates the importance that this organization places on this topic. Um, I'm going to give an overview of the landscape of long-acting HIV treatment and prevention innovations, and I'm going to focus on agents in development, mainly in clinical development. I am not going to talk about cabotegravir and rolpivirine. Those will be covered elsewhere in this session. So I'm really only going to talk about agents that have not yet been approved, and here are my disclosures. I'm going to start with... Um, uh, I'm going to organize this by route of delivery, and I'm going to start with oral agents in development for long-acting administration. Um, the leading agent uh, in development for long-acting oral administration is this molecule, is Latrovir, previously known as EFDA. It's an adenosine analog. It acts as a DNA chain terminator, but because it has a three-prime hydroxyl in the ribose ring, um, it's incorporated into the RNA-DNA duplex, and it halts or freezes the transcription complex. And thus, it is known as a, a translocation inhibitor, an NRTTI, 
and has a unique mechanism of action and a unique, uh, 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 fairly unique uh, resistance profile as compared to other nucleosides. It has an exceedingly long half-life in plasma. It's also an exceedingly potent drug, both of which make it an ideal candidate for long-acting formulations. And um, until uh, a, a number of months ago, it was in development uh, in both an oral weekly version for treatment and an oral monthly version for PrEP. Um, and this is its uh, potent activity given as monotherapy in 10-day uh, in monotherapy studies after a single dose of 0.5 to 30 milligrams. Now, as, as most of you are probably aware, the clinical development of this compound is mostly currently on hold. Uh, there are continu there's continuing follow-up of individuals who are in um, is Latrovir daily oral administration trials, but all other trials have been placed on hold by regulatory agencies, and that's because of an unexpected toxicity seen after long-term exposure to this drug, um, namely lymphopenia. And since CD4 counts are also dependent on total lymphocyte counts, there was also uh, a drop in, a significant drop in uh, CD4 counts in some patients. And that, as a consequence, led to uh, uh, the uh, uh, regulatory agencies placing the cl further clinical development of this drug on hold, at least temporarily. Um, as Latrovir was in development as a once-weekly treatment, oral treatment, with this other long-acting oral drug, MK8507, a once-weekly non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, another potent a drug, and this is its activity in monotherapy studies. And um, the development of this drug is also currently on hold because it does not have a once weekly oral partner. Now, I think the Islatrovir situation raises a number of important questions. The first is that Merck has shown that the degree of lymphopenia with Islatrovir was definitely related to the dose of the drug and probably uh, in, uh, in turn to the concentrations of the active metabolite of this drug, its nucleoside triphosphate inside uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And so that raises the question as to whether lower doses of Islatrovir would meet safety and efficacy targets without causing lymphopenia. There's also the question as to whether or not there are patient populations for whom Islatrovir might never be an appropriate drug, that is, a, a patients in whom you would never want to produce any degree of lymphopenia. And finally, could there be drug delivery platforms, for example, implants, that would not produce lymphopenia? Merck reported that their Islatrovir implants did not produce lymphopenia in healthy volunteers although it's important to note that the duration of those studies was only 12 weeks. Now I'm going to switch now to implantable antiretrovirals, and I'm going to focus on uh, uh, this technology. This is a cartoon of a scaffold for delivery of tenofovir alafenamide, TAF, uh, from a subcutaneous implant. Now why would anyone be interested in TAF implants? Well, it's important to remember that none of the approved long-acting drugs, cabotegravir or um, rilpivirine, have activity against hepatitis B virus. And that's also true for most other long-acting ARVs in current clinical development. And as we heard earlier today, there is a large population of infected individuals who are co-infected with hepatitis B virus. And if we want long-acting technology that will serve those individuals, we're going to have to pursue something like a long-acting tenofovir alafenamide implant. Now, this is the uh, pharmacokinetic profile of this same implant when, given, uh, when used in, uh, in this case, beagle dogs showing in the uh, dark uh, circles here uh, plasma TAF concentrations. In the open circles, uh, these are uh, tenofovir concentrations. Uh, and in the uh, uh, closed diamonds, these are uh, intracellular uh, tenofovir diphosphate concentrations in peripheral blood mononuclear cells, showing that uh, a single implant maintains uh, effective antiviral concentrations of tenofovir for uh, up to 40 days in this study. Uh, now, 
a number of tenofovir alafenamide implants have been associated with significant local toxicity, including tissue necrosis. And as a consequence, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that had been very interested in this technology decided it was no longer going to pursue funding. However, an analysis published last year by Joe Romano, Mark Baum, and their colleagues showed that in these animal studies, the local toxicity of a tenofovir alafenamide implant was actually related to the rate of release of the drug from the implant, uh, ex expressed as milligrams per day. So the, the tenofovir alafenamide implants that have a slower daily release rate actually produce little or no local toxicity. And so I think this provides us a pathway for developing path uh, TAF implants that will not produce local toxicity in humans. And there are, are clinical studies uh, being planned and uh, um, already up and running with a tenofovir alafenamide implant in South Africa. Now I'm going to switch next to subcutaneous ARVs. And the leading candidate in this category is, uh, is lenacapavir, an HIV capsid inhibitor. This drug has a unique mechanism of action and also a unique resistance profile. It also has more than one site of activity against HIV replication, which may contribute to its uh, high, barrier, high barrier to resistance and its uh, potency. Um, the, uh, this drug has been shown in uh, phase two, three clinical trials in heavily treatment experienced uh, people living with HIV. Uh, who have resistance to other antiretroviral drug classes to significantly reduce viral load in the short term um, in this figure over 14 days. These were data that were presented last year at CROI. Um, this study, the first 14 days involved oral drug. That's where these data come from. But that, the study is ongoing with every six months lenacapavir being injected subcutaneously, and we hope to hear about results from that study soon. Um, in addition, the, uh, this study has been used to make an application for approval of this drug for treatment uh, in highly experienced patients with uh, resistance to other ARV classes. One of the complicating things about lenacapavir is because its half-life is so long when you give it subcutaneously, it requires a loading dose to bring concentrations quickly up to their antiretroviral level. And that means giving an oral loading dose three doses over eight days, two 600 milligram doses at day one and day two, a 300 milligram dose at day eight, and then uh, the ability to switch over to the subcutaneous dosing, 927 milligrams every six months. Uh, and so two formulations of this drug are going to have to be developed. I'll switch now to intravenous ARVs. And there are actually quite a few of these, but they're all broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. So this is just a, a, a cartoon summarizing a number of broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been put into uh, development. And the ones circled in blue have actually been tested in human subjects, uh, either seronegative volunteers or HIV-infected volunteers. Now, one of the uh, interesting pharmacologic profiles of uh, monoclonal antibodies is that a simple two amino acid mutation in the FC binding domain of these antibodies dramatically increases their plasma half-life. So this is a figure from an article published in 2019 looking at the comparative pharmacokinetics, in this case, in seronegative volunteers of VRCO1 uh, unmodified in the purple as compared to VRCO1 with this two amino acid mutation in these green, green triangles, showing the dramatic increase and slowing of clear, increase in concentrations and slowing of clearance with this simple two amino acid change. A sim, the, the same um, uh, two amino acid change uh, did not have quite the same benefit um, in a related monoclonal antibody, VRCO7, indicating that we still have a lot to learn about the uh, pharmacokinetics of uh, these molecules, but it's important to point out that VRCO7 is a more potent uh, monoclonal antibody than VRCO1. All right, uh, I'm gonna finish up with this last uh, delivery uh, pathway, um, and that is transdermal antiretrovirals. 
Uh, for a long time, when people asked me if we would ever have transdermal antiretrovirals, I would say no. They're not potent enough. The delivery properties aren't right. It's just not something to expect in our lifetime. Well, when I made that statement, I did not know about microneedles and microarray patches. So this is my hand wearing a circular microarray patch, uh, in this case, a placebo patch. At least that's what I hope it was. Um, the, the, these patches, each of these patches has hundreds of microneedles. Um, when inserted through the skin, you actually can't feel very much. It's like wearing a piece of sandpaper on your skin. I wore this patch all day. I pulled it off expecting to see some redness and swelling, and I saw absolutely nothing. So a, wearing a microneedle, it's like getting bitten by a mosquito with no itch and no transmittable diseases. So this is amazing technology that has great promise for delivery of antiretroviral drugs. So this is how these patches work. This is a figure from my colleague, uh, Ryan Donnelly, at Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, you load, in, in this case, you can load nanoformulated drugs, uh, similar to what would be done with cabotegravir or oral pivorine, at high concentration into an aqueous gel that's cast into a mold. You dry that mold and add a border adhesive with an occlusive backing. You place that on the skin. You detach the base plate from the adhesive. Um, and then nanoformulated drug through these needles is deposited into the subdermal tissue where it forms a subdermal reservoir that can release drug very slowly over a period of weeks to months, much like an intramuscular injection of cabotegravir or real pivorine. Oops, we seem to be stuck here. There we go. So uh, this is pharmacokinetic data from a study with two different uh, microarray patches delivering cabotegravir in laboratory animals, in this case in rats. So the uh, uh, blue triangles at the top are the traditional intramuscular nanoformulated cabotegravir, same formulation as that given to humans. But the, down at the bottom in the red is a nanoformulated cabotegravir patch or a non-nanoformulated long-acting uh, cabotegravir patch. And what you can see is that in rats, you uh, can release cabotegravir after application of a single patch with concentrations exceeding the antiviral threshold for more than a month. So this is early technology, but quite encouraging. There have been clinical studies with this, this technology, mainly with placebo patches, looking at tolerability and patch performance. But I think we're going to see studies with uh, these patches in, uh, in healthy volunteers with antiretrovirals in the next two to three years. What else is the future going to hold besides microarray patches? Uh, I think there's going to be better implant technologies. There will also be bioerodible implants, that is, implants that polymerize after injection but then degrade spontaneously over time and therefore don't have to be removed. There are already strategies being pursued to reduce the injection volume for cabotegravir and uh, rilpivirine, which will make them more convenient. There are gastric reservoirs that can deliver a drug uh, if, uh, if given orally, although right now this technology is limited to delivering antiretrovirals for no more than 14 days. Um, and there is also combination technology, delivering antiretroviral drugs in combination, for example, with hormonal contraceptives. And there are uh, uh, combinations of depivirine rings and hormonal con of, depiv of a depivirine ring and hormonal contraceptives uh, to be delivered topically that are in development right now. So it's a very exciting field. It's hard to keep up. There's lots going on. Fortunately, there are a lot of good resources out there for you. This is one I would recommend. This is the Long-Acting Technologies Patents and Licenses Database, LAPAL. It's hosted by our host for today's session, uh, the Medicines Patent Pool, and it's uh, accessible through their website or through lapal.ch. Um, uh, Labna Gaeb is the, is the queen of uh, LAPAL, and she's with us today and will be part of our panel. It's a wonderful source of information. It's a beautifully designed website. It's frequently updated, and it's a great way to uh, keep up with the field. And then finally, I'll also uh, uh, 
uh, alert you to our website for the long-acting uh, antiretroviral research resource program, LEAP, longactinghiv.org. I want to acknowledge people who shared their slides with me for today's presentation, including some unpublished slides, and also acknowledge my funding sources, and I look forward to a great session. So thank you all for being here. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Charlie, and, and thank you for the uh, wonderful ad for uh, L.A. Powell. <laughs> um, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> uh, and it now gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Nitaya uh, Panupak, who is Executive Director of the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation in Bangkok. Nitaya, over to you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and um, welcome everyone to this session. Um, I am, uh, have a great pleasure to um, share some thoughts with you about the sustainable service delivery for long acting um, products. And um, this is my uh, conflict of interest disclosure. So during this talk, I will try to answer two questions. Um, first is why is service delivery model such, as, such an important aspect when thinking about implementing long acting products? And then the second one is what are key considerations from a service delivery perspective? What are enablers and what are um, challenges? And I will focus this talk on long acting prep products because I have no experience at all um, about long acting products for treatment. Um, and I will use just a few slides to um, show to you why service delivery model is such an important aspect when you're thinking about integrating long acting prep products into an existing um, oral prep program. And um, I will just uh, use some data from Thailand um, to frame, just only to frame the discussion on this issue. And um, this slide showed to you that um, the, in Asia Pacific, Thailand and Vietnam uh, ranked second and third after Australia in terms of the cumulative number of PrEP users um, with uh, more than 30,000 um, cumulative PrEP users so far um, by um, the first quarter of this year. Um, and these two countries, Thailand and Vietnam, share one similarity in terms of the key service delivery model in rolling out um, oral PrEP um, in these two countries, which is the use of the key population-led PrEP um, service delivery model. And in Thailand, um, as of now, 80% of current PrEP users receive PrEP from KP-led providers in KP-led clinics, uh, which are expanding in number uh, throughout the country. And um, although we rank second in the region in terms of number of PrEP users, uh, you can see here that we were uh, successful in getting um, only just above one-fifth of the individuals uh, who would benefit from PrEP uh, to be aware of and to make decision to start oral PrEP. And this is the result of um, continuous efforts made over the past eight years uh, after we introduced PrEP into our national guidelines. So certainly more innovations, more efforts are needed. And this uh, slide is just to get you into a bit more details on uh, how KP-led PrEP service uh, works. And um, in the, this figure, you will see that once a client uh, comes into a KP-led clinic, which is a clinic run solely by KP-led providers, there's no nurses, no uh, doctors in the clinic, that client will have um, blood draw um, performed by KP-led providers. Um, and then um, the KP-led providers also run um, fourth generation rapid um, testing. And then the test result, the HIV negative test result will be shared uh, with the doctor via this online chat application. The doctor will then review test results and then approve uh, PrEP prescription back via that um, online chat application so that the lay provider can give out um, PrEP to the clients almost within the same hour of client coming in uh, to the clinic. And this flow, this service delivery flow is used both for PrEP initiation and PrEP um, continuation. 
And the use of KP-led PrEP service has been so successful in scaling up oral PrEP program um, in our country because it provides accessibility to the clients. It provides availability of um, health services, which is beyond HIV testing and beyond PrEP. It is um, services which are needs-based and client centers, such as hormone um, um, monitoring or gender-affirming um, care for transgender individuals or legal consultation for um, sex workers. And services are also very acceptable because um, staff are members of key populations themselves, so they understand well the um, client's lifestyle and context, uh, as well as the services are provided in a judgmental free um, environment and free from stigma and discrimination. And the quality of service um, is also high and is um, trusted by public health sector. And um, the success of uh, KP-led PrEP service um, is one of several factors leading um, our MOPH to um, legalize KP lay providers um, so that now lay, lay providers can perform fring, finger prick blood collection, perform STI uh, sample collection, um, as well as um, run um, laboratory testing for HIV and um, STI. This is a point of care laboratory testing. And they can dispense PrEP and PEP and ART and oral STI drugs as prescribed by doctors. And um, since September last year, we now have a certified, uh, have increasing number of certified lay providers and certified community-based organization um, throughout the country. And there are three principles which guide um, the implementation of this KP-led PrEP um, service. And the first principle is the demedicalization, which is to identify key elements of um, services which can be task shifted to lay providers or to the clients themselves. And simplification, which is to um, find less complex ways to deliver services um, while maintaining efficacy and uh, quality. And the last one is differentiation, which is to think about the when, where, uh, what, and who uh, based on the client-centered approach. And then when we think about integrating CAP-LA injection into this KP-led oral PrEP program, we can see that um, CAP-LA injection will lead us to remedicalization because the product administration role will be task shifted back from lay providers um, to doctors and to nurses. And we still don't know if CAP-LA will be available in a self-injection form. And then, um, Instead of simplification, um, CAPLA comes with more complexity, especially around um, the HIV testing algorithm, uh, which may need HIV RNA. And we still don't know if third or fourth generation rapid tests or um, self-testing can be used um, um, for CAPLA um, service. And then lastly, um, with more prep products, um, there will be more um, and various um, user patterns. Uh, we still don't know how to um, handle more frequent CAPLA visits or to handle switching in between oral um, product and long-acting product. And, and these, those um, three principles relate to enablers of um, um, CAPLA um, implementation. And these enablers um, include convenience and comfortability and competence in product administration. So for convenience and comfortability, I think we really need to continue to think about simplification and differentiation in order to bring CAPLA out from the hospital, from public clinic uh, into capillate clinic or to home. And in terms of competence in product administration, um, since CAPLA in its current form uh, will need to be injected into um, gluteal muscles by um, conventional healthcare providers, uh, we really need to think about formal demedicalization um, in order to uh, make sure that this injection uh, role can be task shifted um, from doctors or nurses to lay providers or to the clients themselves. And with that, um, with those enablers, um, we can see challenges. And in terms of convenience and comfortability, um, we really need to think about who, where, what, and when um, for for CAP LA initiation, continuation, discontinuation, reinitiation, and switch. And we also need to um, differentiate HIV testing algorithm um, so that, um, I mean, differentiate this based on the status of um, CAP-LA um, um, use, uh, whether that be um, initiation or whether that be continuation. Because uh, with that, we will understand more 
uh, of around when nuclear acid testing is actually needed or when um, rapid test or self-testing may be um, adequate. We also need to think about the integration of cap la injection into other health services, which is of priority for each population, such as family planning, gender affirmation, or STIHCV test and treat services. And also we need to think more about adherent support um, for a clinic visit. It's not adherent support for product administration anymore. It's um, um, adherent support for clinic visit, which is now very important because a clinic visit equals product administration. Um, and then in terms of competence in product administration, there is still, there's still lack of clinical research data on self-injection, reduced volume, um, reduced visit um, injection, alternative injection sites, um, such as injection into thigh muscle or uh, subcutaneous injection, and therefore difficulties in planning for implementation um, research. Um, we also need to think more about capacity building and quality assurance if injection will, at the end, being shifted to lay providers or, or, or for self-injection. And we can foresee um, resistance from professional institution uh, related to regulations and rules uh, for medical product administration um, as well as their mindset. So beyond CAP-LA, when we think about the other long-acting PrEP products in the pipeline, um, we can see these implementation, these common implementation uh, considerations. So if you look at um, oral um, TDF-FTC and CAP-LA um, injection here, you can see that um, CAP-LA may score better in terms of frequency of product use. However, we, as we haven't had any experience um, integrating um, injection, injection products into um, this um, oral um, PrEP service, we still don't know who can be the injector. We also don't know um, how to provide adherence support for a clinic visit, which is now two months uh, instead of three months or six months for oral PrEP program. And we also don't know if we will have enough money to uh, perform more frequent HIV testing, which is now every two months, um, and with more sophisticated HIV testing algorithm, um, and also with like um, almost no um, um, possibility to have generic products available in the near future uh, at an affordable price, even with um, voluntary licensing uh, just um, announced. Um, a country uh, like Thailand, uh, Brazil, Mexico, we are higher middle income country which is not covered under the um, medicine uh, patent pool, we, will, we, we, we see uh, no near opportunities to get the uh, generic products available in the country very soon. So um, there is uh, very little opportunity for us to think about um, the wide scale um, rollout of this um, product. So what I would like to say here is that for other um, future long acting PrEP products, um, the manufacturers may want to think about these common implementation challenges um, during the design of the clinical trials um, in order uh, for us to um, move forward more quickly, more efficiently from clinical trials to implementation research and to wide-scale implementation. So I'd like to end with uh, these um, conclusions and thoughts. Um, we discussed a lot about implementation challenges, but one key um, challenge is availability of the long-acting product. And um, with this, um, the current availability of long-acting PrEP product, it will be unlikely uh, for the long-acting product uh, to become true choice without generic products uh, and the generic products. And, and this is true, not, uh, not even in high income countries, right? Um, and, and the availability of generic products will also need to come uh, with the price which is comparable to oral PrEP products um, in each country. So price could be vary uh, from country to country, but it needs to be comparable to oral PrEP products uh, if you, you really think about having true choice. Um, and creating demand for true choice is also crucial. We have to admit that for oral PrEP and oral PrEP users, they are highly stigmatized because PrEP is related to sex and sexual pleasure, which are very much devalued, especially in our region, in my region. Um, so therefore, if you position long-acting PrEP product as second-line PrEP, you can further stigmatize the users of these long-acting products because they will be uh, seen as someone irresponsible, not only in sex, but now irresponsible in just using oral pills. 
And um, research studies on self-injection or alternative um, injection modalities um, are all urgent in order to plan implementation. And results or findings from these um, studies must be regularly updated and openly discussed because we as an implementers, we need to know what options will become available and when um, in order to plan or adapt implementation research in real time and in order to prepare many other things in our countries like service delivery system guidelines, payment mechanism regulations and policy beforehand. And um, I remain optimistic, although what I just described may not seem so, but I still <laughs> remain optimistic. Um, so I would like to end by saying that things may seem not feasible until we do it. Um, it is just this time we want to do it with a much better plan than what we had um, for oral prep a decade ago. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Natalia. A lot to think about there. Um, um, so, Chiris is the technical manager of strategy at Unitaid. Chiris, over to you. Happy to be able to join with you, uh, even if it's virtually. Um, and I just want to mention that this presentation that has been done in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Carmen Perez Casas, uh, that you probably know quite well. Um, and so I just want to begin with just saying that Unitaid recognizes uh, the game changing nature of long acting medicines and technologies. Uh, to prevent and treat HIV and key opportunistic infections, including tuberculosis and hepatitis C. Um, these products hold the potential to improve adherence, uh, reduce transmission, and uh, the risk of uh, drug resistance, and ultimately to better um, and to save lives. Um, we hear the message from communities who want these products and want a paradigm change. Uh, next slide. The opportunities to advance and move the field of long acting is growing in HIV and other major infectious diseases with products at various stages of development, market entry, or availability for individuals who need them most, particularly in lower and middle income countries. Um, and we believe a collaborative and holistic approach from all involved stakeholders is critical. Uh, next slide. To this end, uh, Unitaid has positioned itself on the forefront of efforts in this space to advance long-acting technologies, and we've developed an approach in the areas of innovation and access, focusing on three key areas. Uh, one, advancing the technology pipeline. Uh, two, accelerating the introduction of emerging products. And three, enabling the access pathway and the scalability. Next slide. This approach was uh, spearheaded through consultation and extensive landscaping work starting in 2018 uh, with the publication of a comprehensive compendium on long acting related to Unitate's disease priorities. And then an early look at intellectual property for these technologies published jointly by the medicines patent pool and Unitate. Um, following this, efforts have progressed with WHO and, and continued uh, with the launch by MPP of the LaPau database that cover intellectual property, including patent information, but will also be expanded in collaboration with LEAP and iBase to include technical information and status updates on products in the pipeline. Next slide. And we're also exploring with many partners on monoclonal antibodies and are planning a workshop later this year um, in consultation on innovative business models that can be um, deployed um, to advance this space. Um, in addition, we've published um, a landscape with a CIF and IMPT around multi-purpose prevention technologies. So both of these areas we think are, are definitely advancing and moving, and um, we're very interested to understand what the opportunities are moving forward. Next slide. Um, and to build on our extensive work on improving medicines for children, we are working with partners such as WHO's Global Accelerator for Pediatric Formulations Network, or GAPF, and others to consider how to better um, 
the delivery of medicines and improve prevention and treatment of major conditions for children, including using uh, long acting technologies. Um, and for example, we have a new catalytic investment in investing a long acting product for nutritional support with Delsa Tech. Next slide. Um, for products in the pipeline for which we are funding the development, access is built in early on in the development. Um, so we really pay attention to this. And for example, we include uh, provisions for access and voluntary licensing in all product development related to these technologies. Um, Unitate has ensured resulting products will be able to reach those in need without delay. So that's on the innovation side. Um, and then we, in, and including in that, um, we also ensure that these products are fit for purpose. Um, so from the production perspective, uh, these technologies were selected because of their robustness um, and their possibilities of LMIC production. Um, and so we also look very closely at uh, having a low cost of goods. Um, from the beginning. Um, and so we're also ensuring other aspects of the target formulation profile are aligned with administration and delivery characteristics that can be compatible with the needs for low resource settings. Um, and for example, in this regard, um, no code chain targeting easiest ways for delivery, such as subcutaneous uh, administration or having one shot um, where it's possible. Um, and so therefore, if successful, if these products do move through development and into market, um, they will be also very much easier and cheaper to deliver. And then for products coming out of the pipeline, we're working in close co coordination with key stakeholders. Uh, Unitate is advocating for equitable access to emerging products, notably long acting prep. Um, this work supports the mid to longer term goals, ensuring a robust and sustainable pathway of affordable, sufficient and generic supply of products, um, including through the Unitate funded medicines patent pool uh, and CHI, as well as we're working to ensure that there's short term access to originated product, um, which and and that is accessed in lower middle income countries. And so um, one of our biggest calls is for all companies involved in evaluating new prep options that they um, that can provide choices for people in need that they co coordinate sooner than later uh, to ensure a sustainable and equitable access pathway. Um, and so that's one of our biggest um, pushes right now. And we think um, uh, we can achieve that. Next slide. Uh, this work supports the, um, oh, so I mentioned that. And so I think I'll just end it there, but I, I think we have a really strong portfolio uh, around long acting and we're committed to really working together with our partners. And we see many areas to be leveraged, uh, many areas to um, to look at um, that can be cross-cutting um, and ensure that uh, whether it's, uh, products in the pipeline or products um, that are emerging in the two market or products that are on the horizon that we have the proper things in place to ensure that they get to those in need. So I'll just end it there and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Cherise. And last but not least, we have Rachel Badgley who is the team lead for testing, prevention, and populations in the global HIV, hepatitis, and STI program at WHO. And Rachel will share with us the new WHO guidelines on long actings. Thank you very much, Adiba, for um, that introduction. And thank you very much, Charles and colleagues, um, for inviting me um, to this session. Um, and I'm going to um, talk about the new WHO um, guideline on long-acting uh, injectable capitagravir, which we have launched um, today at the conference. Um, I think everyone in the room, everyone at the conference, um, has been extremely excited by the results from the capitagravir um, trials um, um, over the past couple of years. Um, it's really grabbed everyone's imagination. The results were so stunning um, in that um, nearly 80% um, relative risk reduction compared with, um, 
with oral prep um, in both uh, 083 and 084. And of course, um, unsurprisingly, WHO, well, she's quite surprised. I'm looking at Mitchell there, and he's, he's uh, going to laugh at me. I said, um, we, we acted quite quickly um, uh, to, um, to make a recommendation um, on cabotegravir, and we're very pleased that we can um, support that um, here today. One thing I do want to, um, to um, just stress is that doesn't mean that oral prep um, doesn't work and isn't still very effective. And I think it's really important to look at the difference in adherence um, between uh, um, the injectable um, cab and, and oral prep. And, and again, unsurprisingly, um, uh, injectable um, cab in the trials was almost perfect. And a lot of people did have um, difficulties um, taking a, a, a tablet every day. Um, so there was very significant differences in, in, in adherence in, uh, um, between the two products. The good news um, is that um, this highly effective um, um, result continued in the, um, in the, um, after unblinding, and those results have started to trickle in from 084 and 085, and I think that's really, really exciting. There's a tiny bit of caution in that... Um, um, as, soon as, um, as soon as they became unblinded and people were out of the, the formal trials, adherence did slip a little bit. And I think that really points to us as we think about um, future delivery, that we've got to make things as easy and as supportive and look at ways of, of supporting people to continue um, effectively on injectable PrEP. Um, when we were um, developing this, um, this guidelines and um, um, we, we reviewed um, all the available evidence, there were some, some, some gaps and I, I think we need this is why WHO is really pushing um, for implementation science to address these. All the data we have comes from those two um, fantastic trials, but we really want to know a little bit more about what's going to happen when, um, when CAB gets out into the real world. Um, there's some, uh, um, you know, very little um, data from some populations. I think the, um, the trials have to be applauded for having a good mix of geographies and um, a good mix of populations. Um, but there were some, and I'll come on to those in a minute, that, that we need to consider further. Um, very little information on drug resistance, um, and that's really because there were so few seroconversions um, in those trials, um, and we have to monitor that closely um, so that we, we um, can understand more um, the potential and the, and the implications of drug resistance in, in cases that occur whilst taking PrEP. Very sparse evidence on pregnancy and safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding um, because women in the trial um, were... Um, um, were, um, they had to, had to take um, long-acting reversible contraceptives. However, um, there were pregnancies, and there will continue to be more, and there are no signals at the moment that this is an issue. Um, so that's very reassuring. When I uploaded these slides um, a few days ago, um, we didn't have any data on gender-affirming hormone therapy and integration and um, with, with CAB, um, which, of course, is a big concern for the transgender community. But yesterday we did, or today. Um, I'm getting slightly lost in the in the time. But um, um, Beatrice Grinstein from um, 083 was able to give us really reassuring data that there aren't um, there is, is no concern there. Um, and of course, um, um, lots of lots of um, questions around cost and cost effectiveness. Um, I just want to also say, as part of our review. Um, WHO is always very, very um, concerned about um, the um, values and preferences of both providers um, and, um, and potential um, recipients of CAB. And we did a PrEP provider survey, and we were pleased to get um, more than a 1,000 um, PrEP providers from all over the world, um, and there was an incredible ge geographic um, representation, um, a, a large proportion from low- and middle-income countries. And we were rather surprised that um, you know, it was only about 50% who'd actually were aware of CAB. Um, and this, this survey was done at the beginning of the year. Um, but however, about 70% um, of those who had heard of CAB um, 
would consider providing it, and very, very few would not. So we've still, um, you know, outside our little bubble of um, people attending conferences, we really need to get more information out to um, PrEP providers about this new um, exciting um, uh, PrEP option. Um, we also conducted a, a systematic review of the large number of papers that are out there looking at, at people's PrEP preferences. Um, the majority of these, of course, are hypothetical, um, many of them discrete choice experiments, um, and there's a bit variability um, across geographies and across um, populations, but a lot, of, a lot of interest and some preference for injectables. And of course, unsurprisingly, um, people who, um, who, um, who find it difficult to take pills um, on, on a daily basis um, are concerned about um, and, and um, really value discretion. And those who've had experience with other injectables, such as those for um, contraception, like DMPA, um, really were more were, were um, really interested in um, in um, prep um, in an injectable prep as an option. We also um, were really um, lucky to be able to partner with the ne um, the global networks um, of key populations: Gate, Impact, NSWP, and Input, and they were. Um, doing some values and preference um, work for us as we developed our key population guidelines and they included questions on PrEP um, and long-acting PrEP. And again, very variable results but a lot of interest um, um, but very mixed awareness. Again, you know, we've got to get messages out there as we start to offer more choices so that um, uh, communities have that opportunity to ask and explore um, options. And overriding from these uh, values and preferences is always about choice. Um, um, not, not everybody wants one thing, and people might want choice and that ability to choose and switch. Um, the cost effectiveness um, uh, um, data that was we, we, we um, found from our reviews was all over the place. Um, there were seven studies and four un unpublished um, preliminary results. And unsurprisingly, it's it's you know it's 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 obvious that the, the cost effectiveness depends on the price of the drug, the price of implementation, and the incidence in the population, or the number needed to prevent um, in the um, in the um, in the population that you um, um, that um, you'd implement prep, long-acting prep. For, for us at WHO, um, um, really one of the critical issues um, was HIV testing on, uh, on CAB. And um, um, the FDA, um, in its approval of CAB, and, and therefore um, the company in its um, instructions for use and uh, patient information, um, stipulates that molecular testing um, is required when you start um, PrEP, uh, when you start um, um, CAB, and for every injection. And this is um, something um, that Nisaya pointed out was, um, was a, was a oh, I've got one minute, so I'll try and speed up a bit, was a, was a major, major um, concern. And um, um, this will really reduce feasibility and increase costs in low and middle income countries. So we have, um, we've, we, we've, we've looked very carefully at the data, we've had um, uh, several consultations, and we feel that it's, um, we're in a place where we're going to be much more flexible um, and support countries to make a decision um, according to their um, circumstances, and that um, using um, serial antibody tests as part of a national strategy um, should be um, adequate. Um, we discussed NAT and the pros and cons of that. And, and then finally, just, just to say what we are doing next, um, um, as soon as we um, had our guideline meeting and, and uh, the guideline group um, decided to recommend it, um, WHO added CAB to the expression of um, interest so that the manufacturer could apply for inclusion in, pre, in our pre-qualified list. That's ongoing. Um, with our recommendation, Global Fund and others can um, and now um, um, include PrEP uh, um, CAB in its, its procurement and we hope that our guidelines will support countries to consider um, introducing CAB in their prevention programs. We're also um, supporting a big push for rapid implementation science to answer some of those questions, where to deliver, how people will choose and switch between products, gather that 
um, further data on, on safety um, in pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, monitor drug resistance and see whether um, what, which testing approaches are, ad are adequate. And really importantly, um, to push for more implementation science in populations and geographies that aren't included um, in the trials. Sex workers were not specifically included in either trial, and we feel that this is a, a population that could really benefit, um, but they need to be involved and um, consulted and, and programs there. People inject drugs, and a real push for projects in Asia. We know UNITAID um, is supporting projects in, in, South, in, in, in Southern Africa and, and Latin America. Um, and, and PEPFAR in, in, um, in East and, East, East and Southern Africa, but Asia is, 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 is far behind and we know there's a huge need there. And just finally, um, and I'm looking at Mitchell Warren in the front row, who's galvanizing us all um, as part of a, um, a, an initiative to really push for product availability, access and price um, with a collaboration with UNITAID, um, with the um, Global Fund, um, with UNAIDS and WHO. And um, we will, as WHO, be updating, updating now all our implementation guidance on the oral prep to include um, capitography and the depivirine vaginal ring. Lots of thank yous. This is five minutes, but behind this, so many people have given time, and, um, um, and particularly those um, external conferences contributors to WHO, our guidelines group and peer reviewers. I can see several of you in the room who've contributed and I really extend my huge thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to all of our uh, presenters for some really great talks. Uh, Adiba, I and uh, our speakers are going to leave the floor now to the Industry Liaison Forum and specifically the co-chairs to introduce uh, a panel discussion. Our co-chairs are Anton Pozniak, uh, immediate past president of IAS, as I'm sure you know, and uh, consultant physician at the uh, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in the UK, and um, Helen McDowell, who is uh, head of global affairs at uh, Vive Healthcare. Over to you. a really important and interesting conversation. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing uh, the phenomenal panelists that we have with us tonight. Um, so firstly, uh, Mitchell Warren, Executive Director of AVAC. Then we have uh, Lillian Moreco from the International Coalition of Women Living with HIV in Eastern Africa. Welcome, Lillian. Then we have Wesley Kraft um, from here from iPlus Solutions in the Netherlands. Wesley's Director of Global Supply Chain and Project Director at iPlus. To my left, we also have Nina Russell from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation based in the US, where Nina leads two programs for HIV prevention and tuberculosis, and in her spare time also supports COVID-2 <laughs> vaccine efforts as well. And last but certainly not least, we've got Dave Rippon, from, who is the Executive Vice President of Infectious Diseases and the Chief Scientific Officer of CHAI. Thank you for joining us to this evening. Now, before we get into some questions, uh, please do come to the mic, ask some questions. We know there might be some questions coming through as well uh, for people who are joining us virtually. Please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible. I think we've got about 25 minutes. Um, but yeah, look forward to the discussion. Anton. Uh, yeah, I, I can hear you. Oh, great, okay, we're gonna wait.
We are here today because we have an HIV prevention emergency. 1.5 million HIV infections every year is an indictment of our leadership. Every two minutes, a new infection among adolescent girls or young women. This is unacceptable. Long-acting injectable PrEP is a game-changing, revolutionary tool for HIV prevention. But WHO guidelines on rolling CAP LA for PrEP meaning nothing as long as communities can get this product because of Viv Grit. We have no praise for Viv today. Helen, Viv prices for CAP LA is set five times the cost of generic oral PrEP. This is greed and it's unacceptable. Yeah. Yes. What good are scientists' advances? What good are who good are WHO guidelines when our communities have no hope to have access? Viv, we are demanding two things. You must cut the, cut the price down to 50 US dollars per patient per year. Yeah. No excuses. You don't need to wait for a collision to do that is what is right. You know this. We expect every leader in the room to stand with us and call for immediate, immediate global price reduction from VIV. No excuses. No need to, no, no need to wait for the collision. So we demand prices to be lowered. We demand the, redu the, the reduction. You cannot continue making profits out of people's misery. We are tired of HIV infections. We can do this. Yes. Amanda! Amanda! Shame on Viv, shame! Shame on Viv, shame! Amanda! Stop prioritizing profits over lives. Stop inequalities, successing. Second, HIV has no border, but your voluntary license excludes people in dire need of this technology who live in upper middle income countries like my country, Brazil, a country where communities, including gay men and trans women, gave selflessly as clinical trial participants to generate data that you have used to secure FDA approval. Well, my country, my country is blocked from benefiting from your license. Shame on you, Viv! Shame! 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 This license is not about charity. This license is about making countries like Brazil, excluded countries like Brazil, like most of Latin America, to pay very high prices. And we are here to say, no more formalize! 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 That's why we are demanding you to include all middle-income countries now, to include technology transfer, and to make sure this license is truly an open license. The time lost while VIV delays will be measured in preventable infections.
Well, thanks to the community for their advocacy, and I think they raise the points that we are also in this room concerned about, which is the global access and the price. So, uh, and uh, you heard our, uh, um, the Brazilian advocate worrying about what's happening in countries where PrEP is needed, but there's no uh, uh, agreement with the medicine patent pool to have generics. So let me just start, I want to ask the two guys on the end, actually, this first question, and please come up to the microphone or send us questions in if you have them. So uh, even if generics are available everywhere, uh, Dave, can I ask you, uh, uh, have we got enough generic companies who are capable of doing this, and how fast could they do it? Because I've heard that there may not be very many, and that it might take them several years. So first, Dave, and then perhaps Wesley, because of your, uh, your knowledge of procurement, you could just come in there. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, y you know, this is not going to be inexpensive to do. There are a lot of suppliers capable of manufacturing this product. The question is, how much investment will they need to make in uh, CapEx and or equipment to do it? Um, it will take longer than a normal oral product. I mean, in part, just because a bioequivalent study with crossovers with dosing frequency of two months is going to take a longer time, plus um, you know those those capital improvements and the like. So I you know I would expect more like a three uh, or more year uh, pathway to getting generics to the market, and you know ultimately the costing will depend on um, you know collectively donors and those who are going to implement risk sharing the investments um, because there's a big difference in potential cost if uh, those suppliers have to amortize all of that investment up front versus having um, you know, support through a mechanism such as a volume guarantee or a development, uh, development grant. Thanks, Dave. Wesley. Here we are. Um, no, so I fully concur with, with Dave's comments. Um, I think there's interest from generic suppliers. Um, the question I've been asked a lot is, um, what's the overall market? And I think it's very encouraging to see that there's um, a lot of interest and there's a lot of appetite for the product. But um, ultimately, the generics will want to know if the investment they're going to make, whether partially funded through donor community or not, will result in a longer term market. Um, I'm convinced that um, the key generic suppliers will do that as they also have a um, responsibility and they feel that responsibility. So I think three, four years, we will see the first uh, generics coming up. Um, they will introduce at what we've also seen for treatment, relatively high prices. And as more generics come to market, we will see a price competition and more availability. So I think the true um, breakthrough might be there in five years or so where we see price reductions, multiple generics coming to market and really picking up the product. Well, if I was sitting from the uh, community point of view, waiting five years for something to come along, uh, uh, we, you know, we, that, that argument has to be made, right? Because by that time, I don't know, the, North, the rich North may have something different. Uh, uh, Nina, from the, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, point of view, um, uh, about pricing, what, what, do you, what do you feel could be done from big foundations uh, like your own or others to try and mitigate the price and, and help uh, do things to, 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 to get these prices down? Uh, well, I'll just reiterate the comments that preceded me that I think we certainly need to understand better um, what the market is going to be, what the demand will is, has the potential to be and then um, what the uh, potential maximal volumes are likely to be and therefore the lowest associated price and work towards that. I think that um, there are mechanisms um, that could be brought to bear that could help in the near term um, to mitigate against pricing issues in the near term uh, that we all, I think, as a community need to explore, volume guarantees and other mechanisms. Lillian, waiting five years at an expensive price. What, what, from your point of view, your, your community that you work uh, for and with, what are they going to say? So, thank you very much. Um, 
I want to join my colleagues who have been here demonstrating to say that uh, we've waited for long as communities. And I think the demonstration here shows uh, that there's a crisis. We are seeing red in the global report. But I just want to speak to your question, reflecting on where I come from, for example, the region that I know very well, that adolescent girls and young women, for example, have waited for choice, for options. But uh, when you get into the rooms where we are, 40 years with the epidemic, we are still complaining of new HIV infections. So for anybody who is watching us, that uh, we have products that are known to work, that can put a menu on table for everybody to choose from, but we are not able to access that, they would not take us seriously. They would probably get all of us in a room and say, don't go back to your countries. Don't go back to your organizations where you come from. And don't go back to be the leaders in the HIV response. Because how do you tell this young woman who is struggling with violence, who has no power to negotiate for safer sex, who cannot use a condom, who is struggling with stigma and discrimination, and therefore they cannot take oral prep, who cannot take daily pills, and we are saying that there's another option that is available and that we have options that they can choose from, but we are not giving them the options. And we are actually saying, continue getting infected so that we can continue having statistics and numbers. So that is the situation that we are dealing with. We are not dealing with bread and butter. We are not dealing with, we are dealing with a complicated situation that I hate to be talking about. That when I got HIV, I was a young girl. There were limited options. Today, I continue telling a story of living with HIV for all these years. You people here in the room and those watching us and those who are on, in boardrooms making decisions and policies, you told us things that we did. You told us, keep yourself safe. Don't get pregnant. We did not get pregnant. When you brought us services, EMT city services, you told us, now we have the services. Get babies. We got babies. They're HIV negative. We did everything to keep them negative. I'm trying to paint a picture of where we are coming from. So now we have these children. They are at the age where we were some of us when we get, got infected, and we don't have tools for them. And here we are, we are talking about prices. So uh, the price is an important factor here that we are talking about, ladies and gentlemen and others. So if there's anything that all of us can do, and I would want to challenge everybody. I want to challenge the pharmaceuticals. I want to challenge everybody in this PEPFAR, Krobo Fund, Belinda Gates, everybody, tell us what we should be doing to make sure that these products are available to people who need them. Adolescent girls and young women, people with disability who are just there and everybody does what they want to do, key and vulnerable populations, what should we do? So to ask me a question is to be asking me to say, if there is any genocide that we should be talking about, that's what we are doing. We are killing people. And we are killing people when we have the tools, when we have the power to change the situation. But we are not doing it. And therefore, five years, it is even now that nobody would want to see anybody getting infected at this moment. There's no reason why we should be now coming here to talk about new HIV infections. But this is what we are singing. So we hold ourselves accountable for the things that we are not doing. And we should all be ashamed that the children and children of our children, the generation that is watching us now, they don't understand us. And therefore, we need to just say we are sorry for what is happening 
because we have everything in our hands, in our control, but we are not doing it. So we cannot talk about five years. Let's talk about now, that it is a shame. We are all shameful for what is happening. Thanks, Lillian. Uh, uh, we, we have a question at the microphone there. Hi, my name is Juliana da Silva. I work for CDC and PEPFAR. My question is, uh, TLD, dolotegravir, became approved in the US in 2014, generic in 2017, and now in 2022, 87% of the drugs displaced in PEPFAR are TLD, which is a huge success. So what can we learn about the TLD rollout? It's not the first time that we try to get first class uh, drugs to lower income country. What can we learn from those successes and why, uh, what can be done to expedite this timeline as, uh, as our colleague just spoke about? Thanks, Mitchell. That's a fantastic question and um, gave me a break because I couldn't follow Lillian possibly in how you described it. And I wanna connect those two because I think we stand at an amazing opportunity right now. And, and I'll, I'll also stand in solidarity with the activists uh, of which I'm amongst. Um, we do have a prevention crisis, we all acknowledge that, and we've all failed in a decade of prevention. Remember, 10 years ago we gathered in Washington DC and oral prep had just been approved. And we have failed in every possible way in making that option a choice for people, as Lillian described. And so I believe we do have amazing lessons from what didn't go right with oral prep, what has gone better um, with uh, DTG, and how do we now not squander the opportunity with us today. And while, um, and I just want to pick up on what Lillian said, I don't think we have to wait five years. We might have to wait five years for a generic. But if we wait five years to get our collective act together about making cabotegravir an, an actual option for people, then we will have truly failed. And I believe that we can do that. And that is the coalition that you've heard described working with a number of partners, because this is not on any one agency. PEPFAR can't do this, Viv can't do this, Chai and AVAC certainly can't do it, the foundation, no one can do this alone. And, and I think the lesson for me from, from what happened with antiretroviral treatment is when people came together. And that was Vive and MPP negotiating there, it was collaborating with Chai, it was getting volume guarantees from donors, it was then making policy decisions through PEPFAR and national governments. And, and we can do all of that. We have to do all of that. And I would just pick up that the, we, we can't wait five years to begin it. We waited a decade to do oral prep. And I don't want to sit here in 10 years and watch our data that Natalia presented so beautifully of how actually how poorly we've done. We should be doing in the next couple of years what we've done in a decade with oral prep. And I believe we can do that with uh, the current cabotegravir in partnership and build a sustainable market because I just want to pick up on one other thing that Wesley said. This is not enough for not only one manufacturer, but we also have, have this challenge because if we just have one generic, we'll get a slightly lower priced product, only slightly. We need multiple generics to create competition. But for any of these generics in Vive to make this product, we need a market. We need a sustainable market that can be serviced by multiple suppliers. And that's gonna take way more than a low priced vial of cabotegravir. It's gonna take demand creation, it is gonna take provider training, it is gonna take testing, and thank you Rachel Bagley, wherever you are, for your leadership in creating guidance that actually begins to open the opportunity. Um, if we have a label in any place outside of the United States like we have in the US, I believe cab for prep is actually starting even further behind. And WHO, with brilliant guidance put out today, is a facilitator, but the guidelines don't prevent infections, the product doesn't prevent infections, um, regulatory approvals don't prevent infections, it's the programs. And if we think the vial needs to cost less, we also need to think about what the program is gonna cost and be comprehensive and strategic and collaborative. So perhaps a long-winded way to say we have roadmaps to do this. Um, no more roadmaps, we have atlases to cover all of our walls. We need to get our act together together, all of us, civil society, advocates, policymakers, funders, and just begin to act and stop being scared of taking the next step. It's gonna be uncomfortable. We're gonna have more protests. Some of us who are protesting are gonna be the, the victims of that protest and it's gonna reverse roles. We need to get comfortable with that uncomfortableness and that's how we build on the Dalyotegravir experience and that's how we prevent some infections, not in five years, but tomorrow. Thanks, Mitchell. Uh, I think a very common theme coming across through all of this is about bold partnerships. Um, I think we've got time for one last question. Thank you. Remco van Leeuwen from Edge Fund in the Netherlands. 
Um, I think a lot of these discussions come down to the fact that we still follow a very traditional model in uh, re recapping the investments from drug development. That is that we uh, ask people to pay per prescription. Um, now, I'm also looking sometimes to the world of antibiotic development mm -hmm. because I think there's a lot of things we can learn from what has happened in that field. And I think a lot of people know that there has been a shortage of antibiotics, uh, difficult to develop, and people are now uh, advocating other uh, models, such as uh, what sometimes is called the Netflix model, where you not pay per prescription, but you pay a fixed fee for bringing a product to the market. Could the panel comment on whether that could be applicable for this discussion on, on, on the pricing of Kabutegevir? I could point a uh, fixed fee model, Netflix. So um, I'm, I'm familiar with this. We're, we're, we're working with some antibiotic manufacturers on these ultra niche products. And I think the model fits for products which sell in very small volume. So you have uh, an inverse relationship between the amount you want to use and the amount you want to invest to have them. I think, you know, I think. Uh, you know, I agree with Mitchell. You know, oral prep and the market size is a complete failure. If you want to avert a million or more infections per year, that means you need tens of millions of prep users per year. We have to absolutely just reset our frame of, of reference and our target. And I, I love the quote: uh, "Things may not seem feasible until we do it." Um, you know, I think. In, in this case, we want an incredibly high volume product. And I think we need to collectively, and you know, I say we, I'm not a, a person who's a, a donor, but we collectively need to place our bets and say this will be a high volume product and make the investments volume guarantees now. If you look at TLD uptake, you know, two things I take away from that. One was a volume guarantee um, uh, that was anchored by the Gates Foundation which made sure that the product introduction was at a lower cost than the, the current product. That meant there was no cost effectiveness decision to be made. It was simply a decision of which product is better. The second, and I think the most impactful component, was proactive partnership well in advance with community. The community was pulling that product out of our hands. If you go back in time and look at the Tenofovir introduction, where we did not proactively work with community, there was skepticism and uptake was much slower. So I think we, we need to resolve now to make some massive investments. This is clearly a transformational category of product, and that is why we're seeing the passion and urgency in the room. And the time is on us now to make those investments. I, you know, we, we can't wait five years. I say three years is the target, not five. But um, we have to start today with the scale up. Um, you, you don't just flip a switch and go to tens of millions of users, you, you get there over time. No, I just want to, uh, thanks, Dave. That was fantastic re response because I think that it's, you know, from what you and Mitchell and others have said, it's a way in to try and get this moving fast. But I want to end with, with what the uh, Brazilian activist was saying, and I get this all the time. Hey, you guys get funded through PEPFAR, et cetera, et cetera, because you're defined as a, a lower middle income country. If you're not, then suddenly you have to pay Full, full prices, and can we demolish that uh, barrier? How do we do that? I mean, is, is it something that, you know, we should really push for? So, so Nina, from your, your point of view, uh, do you have any thoughts about that or not? If you don't, if you don't know, I don't know how to answer that question. No, I'm not okay. a financing expert, but I, I do want to just build but, but on. But philosophically, you don't have to answer as a finance person. I mean, what, philosophically, what? I agree. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Can I do anything else? Um, no, but I also just wanted to say that I think that everything we're talking about here needs to be done with an eye towards this being the begin of hopefully beginning of hopefully an accelerated pipeline of long acting intervention. So anything that we do for LA Cab, we need to do with an eye towards improvements in LA Cab. You know, once monthly oral, si every six monthly injectable, and un and do this in a way that anticipates a pipeline of products that will hopefully be coming quickly, uh, one on, on the heels of the other. Um, I think that's critically important. We have to we can't just look at this as a now every two monthly LA cab issue. It's got to go beyond that. 
Yeah, yeah please. I just want and to pick up on one thing, and it goes back to what Charlie presented um, at the very beginning of the pipeline. There's some exciting products. They're actually likely to be more expensive technologically. We don't yet know. Um, but remember, back to the question about DTG, when you have a new antiretroviral, there's a me there are pipes through which to flow that product in treatment. We, we do flip switches. We change procurement lines. The providers are there. We just are providing a new drug. We don't have that in prevention. We've never had it in prevention. We have condom programs that have come and gone. Um, we had circumcision programs as a vertical surgical procedure. This is our moment to build a prevention platform for every one of the products to come. And, and that- For every we, country. For every country. Okay. And, and, and that goes back to what Rachel said. If we do this in a handful of countries, I mean, this is, this is the COVID moment. Um, you, don't, you don't stop a, pan a pandemic by definition. You don't stop in a country. You stop a pandemic by acting globally with equity, with urgency, and with scale. And we need to do it for this product and for the pipeline of the future, as Charlie presented. Thanks, Richard. Uh, last word to Lillian. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think we are a learning movement. Because if you look at what we have been able to do with HIV for the 40 years, everything was hard but we risked, and this is the moment again to risk with prevention. We risked and we should risk again. You know, it, it takes hard decisions and hard people like us to do it, and I think we can do it. Because you see, when we are seated here, two years ago, we struggled with COVID. If anybody remembers what happened and how the world moved, this is the moment how we should learn from COVID experience and move because we cannot continue complaining of the things that are within our reach and within our means. And it would take lots of things. Resources are not there, but I also recall that there has never been resources. I remember when we talked about treatment, <laughs> it was the same situation, the same story. But there were people who said, let's risk, let's get there and we got there, and therefore I think we can get there with prevention. Because we have been saying we are not put, doing a lot in prevention. So the tools have been given to us. So let's exploit all ways in terms of how can we make it work so that we can, when we come back here, is it Australia? People who will be going to Australia should be telling a different story than a story that we are telling now. Well, for a young yeah. woman in South Africa, for a young woman in Uganda where I come from, these stories we are telling here, they don't make sense to them because every minute that we are talking here, they are getting newly infected, newly infected, and we are counting statistics. Unless if we are saying that we pride ourselves in those statistics, but that is not what I think the world wants of us. Every life matters. Every human being, wherever they are, matters. And we see that the situation keeps getting worse and worse in the global south, in black people, in people who are criminalized, key populations, in vulnerable groups like women and girls. And that is unacceptable. We cannot allow to live in that world where inequality is what defines us. We all deserve better. And therefore, if we have what we have, Let's look for means of making sure that equally we can be human beings, live dignified lives, and live the lives that we want to live. I think what I'm trying to say is that we are tired of living the lives that we are living just because the world, people who are in positions of power are making decisions that are not pro-people. Thanks, Lillian, for that inspiration and also that hope from the beginning of what you were saying. So I'm, I'm now going to hand over to Helen to, to close the meeting. Yep. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the panelists. I think we could have gone on probably for another 15 minutes and really important points. And I'm sure the dialogue will keep continuing and we look forward to being part of that. In closing, I also just want to say a massive thank you to um, the presenters from the first part of the session really helpful, insightful, deep dives into a number of topics. And a final big thank you to Charles and Adiba uh, for co-chairing the, the, the overall session for us tonight. Uh, we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you for being here. Have a good evening. <laughs>